The House will come to order. The member from Hennepin, Representative Long. Thank you, Madam Speaker. As a reminder, we are on the appeal of the ruling of the Speaker, and I ask members to vote yes. Uh, the 16B.2406 is not in the underlying uh, bill that is in the amendment, and it is custom and usage in our House that it needs to be that one of the main factors we look to is whether it is the same uh, chapter or section of law. It is not, and so I would ask members to vote to uphold the ruling of the Speaker. The member from Stearns, the Minority Leader, Representative Damoth. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and uh, members just remember that we are under a call of the House, and I would encourage a red vote to rule against the ruling of the Speaker. The clerk will take, uh, is there a roll call has not been requested. <laughs> Madam Speaker. Okay, the light went off, so we'll just uh, turn the little light back on. A roll call has been requested. But I'm sure even if it wasn't requested, you could produce the 15 hands. So a roll call has now been requested. There's 15 hands. There will be a roll call. The clerk will take the roll. Members were under call, please vote. Each member must vote for themselves and themselves only. Madam Speaker. Representative Long. I move that those not voting be excused from voting. Representative Long moves that those not voting be excused from voting. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. no. The motion prevails. Those not voting are excused from voting, and the clerk will close the roll. There being 70 ayes and 53 nays, it is the judgment of the House that the ruling of the Speaker pro tem shall stand as a judgment as a decision of the House. Representative Long. Madam Speaker, I move that the call of the House be lifted. Representative Long moves that the call of the House be lifted. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The call of the House is lifted.
There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Joy moves to amend House Law number 1830. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded A14. The member from Clay, Representative Joy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, this amendment is a good amendment. It's just a minor amendment. It, uh, what this amendment does, it deletes everything in the bill and provides appropriations for state agencies and bodies equivalent to the 20, 20, 22 and 23 base. I move this amendment. Um, a little bit about this amendment is what it will do is it will slow things down for us. You know, we're hearing things today from Representative Kosnick about we're spending $10 billion this year in Minnesota. And, you know, by doing this, we slow things down. Every one of us have been in, had people in our office saying they cannot hire people, teachers, para, paraprofessionals, everything, so they cannot find people to do jobs. We're looking at adding 158 new employees to this bill. 158 new employees to the state of Minnesota. I guess we got the magic wand here to hire people. I guess we know how to get people to work for us. But everywhere else, that com everybody comes to us and says, we can't find bodies to do this, but we can do it. So I don't understand why we don't take this, a green vote. And with the labor shortages, this is what we need to do. You know, as we continue to move through this session and we move all these bills through and everything we're doing, I feel we're going to eventually bankrupt Minnesota. You know, when, when you do stuff like that and continue to add taxes to people, we're not funding nursing homes because, you know, we don't want to fund nursing homes. We don't want to drop Social Security. I just have a problem. I think deleting all and just following what we do is what we should be doing in this bill. Um, we just came from debate of what we kind of know what's in the bill, what's not in the bill. And uh, we figured that out. So this amendment, I think, is an important amendment. We can take this, move this bill forward, take this amendment on there, and decide what we want to do next year with this bill. Um, and I will also request a roll call. Roll call having be cr been requested, seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. So I guess with that, uh, I will, uh, I I'm, I'm, would love to talk to anybody that can convince me this is a good bill. You know, when you look at, we're going to give checks, to, uh, rebate checks and everybody like that. Why don't we use that money for nursing homes? The $234 or $290 people are going to get? I bet people will give it up for the nursing homes to stay open. It's going to cost us more than that. You know, I mean, I, I am just, this session has been my first session, and I tell you what, it's been an overwhelming session. The Democrats continue to put more on to us, to add more. This isn't what people want. Nobody wants 158 new employees. By the time we get done this year, I'll be, I'll be, Surprised to see how many employees. One, can we fill the jobs? No. So do we just create 150 new employees because we think it's a good idea? I don't think it's a good idea. You know, so thank you. There's an amendment to the amendment. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Nadu moves to amend the Joy Amendment to House File Number 1830. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment to the amendment is coded A46. The member from Hennepin, Representative Nadeau. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Thank you, members. It's been a long night, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go really quick. This is a very simple amendment. Um, Minnesota students, they deserve stability. But without our help, without us prioritizing um, teachers, recognizing those staffing shortages that we have, we're not going to get there. Um, reliable pensions that are fair honor our teachers. Um, and they're going to help us recruit and retain the best educators. My amendment doesn't solve the world with pensions, but it makes a start. And it helps us prioritize by putting our vote and our money where we believe that the next generation of our, stu of our, of our leaders are coming from. So this amendment is, is simple. Did I move my amendment yet? You don't need to move it. I did. Representative Nadeau. Thank you, Madam Speaker. You did Speaker. not ask for a roll call. Thank you, Madam Speaker. So my amendment is pretty simple. 
it, uh, it takes the, the savings from, um, from Representative Joy's bill and it transfers $400 million over to the TRA um, pension plan. Now that, it's not a ton. I think it needs to be a lot more, but that's what I could do with, with this amendment. Um, there's a couple of options that we can make. By combining that with what's in the pensions bill, it creates about $550 million. That will buy down one year, one year, from 66 to 65. It will reduce the penalty, the early re penalty retirement for a 62-year-old teacher by 7%. This is a step in the right direction. State government is going to be fine. They're going to be fine. Our teachers, our students, our schools are not going to be fine. And I'm not picking on the governor. I'm not picking on in anybody. This is, a, this is a good amendment that can focus those resources where we want to go. Um, and now, Madam Speaker, I will request a roll call. I had a feeling you would. Seeing 15 hands, there will be a roll call. Any discussion to the amendment? Representative Cleborn. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Nadeau, I appreciate your kind heart and your good intentions. I am going to encourage a no vote. We will be hearing the pensions bill, I hope, soon on the floor. And we are working very hard with the chair to serve our teachers. And the bill has the largest one-time investment in pensions for our teachers. So well, let's wait for that pensions bill. I think this is a little premature. There's still time for us to do more good work together. Members, I'm going to ask for a no vote on the amendment to the amendment. The member from Dakota, Representative Kosnick. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and I appreciate the comments of the Chair Cleavorn. Uh, Representative Nadeau offers a neat uh, idea, and uh, unfortunately, uh, when we heard uh, the pensions bill in the tax committee, uh, the author, the, the Chair of the Pensions said, we need to raise taxes, adding a fifth tier, because her bill did not dedicate the revenue raised which, by the way, overall, we're raising $10 billion in taxes this season under the Democrats' plan, so that your, your amendment, uh, Representative Nadeau, would actually help the pensions plan where the fifth tier income tax proposal doesn't dedicate it towards the pensions. And so I like your amendment, and I think uh, we should support it. Seeing no further discussion, the clerk will take the roll. We can pause if Representative Myers really wants to say something. The member from Hennepin, Representative Myers. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, I really want to thank Representative Nadeau for this amendment. My mom and dad were teachers. Uh, my sister is currently a teacher. And we all know that educators are the foundation of our schools. And, you know, we've been through a lot here tonight, but I would think this would be the one amendment that we could all agree on. Teachers have looked to us. They've come to our offices. They've been out in that rotunda. I mean, I've gotten emails from hundreds of teachers in my own district and teachers from other districts. I just want to applaud Representative Nadeau for pushing this forward. I'm hoping everybody can support this. And let's get a green vote. Clerk will take the roll. Members, please vote. <laughs> the clerk will close the roll. There being 56 ayes and 73 nays, the amendment to the amendment is not adopted. Representative Joy, we are on the underlying amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Representative Nadeau, that was a great amendment. I didn't think about that when we were going to save some money there and put it instead of investing in 158 more employees in Minnesota. But uh, everybody, I encourage you to vote green. Thank you. The member from Hennepin, Representative Cleborn. 
Thank you, Madam uh, Speaker. Members, I'm just going to ask you to vote no. This amendment really uh, keeps the systemic disinvestment that we have seen over the last few decades in place. We need to be moving forward. We need to be supporting our state government and building a strong state for Minnesota that serves all Minnesotans. Please vote no. The clerk will take the roll on the amendment. The clerk will close the roll. There being 59 ayes and 70 nays, the motion does not prevail. The amendment is not adopted. There's a motion at the desk. The clerk will report the motion. <coughs> Long moves that rule 3.33. Relating to amendments must be pre-filed, be suspended for the purpose of offering, offering the Torkelson RA23-004 amendment to House File Number 1830. Representative Long. Uh, Madam Speaker, uh, that is my motion. I ask that members uh, support the motion to suspend the rules so that we can vote on a negotiated agreement with Representative Torkelson. Any discussion on the motion to suspend the rules to take up an amendment? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. There's an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. <clears throat> Torkelson moves to amend House Bill number 1830. The second engrossment as amended. The amendment is coded RA23-004. The member from Brown, Representative Torkelson, to your amendment. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I, is the amendment being passed out? It looks like it is, Representative right, Torkelson. Very good. I will speak to the amendment. Uh, it's, it's short and easy to read. Uh, this amendment deals with the Capitol Barber. Uh, those of you, most of you know that the Capitol Barber uh, service has a service in the basement of the SOB. The Capitol Barber Shop has been here since 1883 on this campus, and it's, the Capitol Barber has been in the SOB since 1932. It's the oldest operating barber shop in the country. Ken Kirkpatrick, former president of the National Board of Barbers, sold the business to his son, Josh, in the recent history, and Josh is now operating the business. The new, newly uh, minted amendment uh, is actually an excellent amendment. It will require that the Capitol Barber have space in the state capitol building, the crossroads of uh, activity here at the, on the St. Paul campus of Minnesota government, and I urge you to vote green. Any discussion to the amendment? Representative Cleborn. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, this is a good amendment. I'm glad to see that we have this bipartisan amendment. Please vote yes. All those in favor of the Torkelson Amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. There's a motion at the desk. The clerk will report the motion. Long moves that House Rule 3.33 relating to amendments must be pre-filed, be suspended for the purpose of offering the Schultz RA23-007 amendment to House File Number 1830. Representative Long. Madam Speaker, I ask that members support this motion to suspend the rules to allow an amendment from Representative Schultz to be taken up. Discussion on the Long motion. Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. There is an amendment at the desk. The clerk will report the amendment. Schultz moves to amend House Bill number 1830. The second engrossment as amended. Amendment is coded RA23-007. The member from Morrison, Representative Schultz, to your amendment. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, this, uh, this amendment, uh, I believe it's the 823-007, Amendment uh, it speaks to a greater issue about our capital area complex and the way that the public engages uh, with its government and uh, by way of ensuring that as capital buildings across this complex are built, that we make sure 
to insert some language to protect the green space of this capital complex. Uh, we found a way tonight uh, to have some language before us that would ensure that there is, and specifically, no net loss of green space on the capital complex with additional construction that may occur. And so that's the amendment, members, and this speaks to a greater and larger point. The community that lives here in St. Paul around the Capitol complex is seeing decisions made by this body that aren't taking their voices into account, and it's wrong. And further, we're not following the right process. This body in this chamber voted on a piece of legislation in the last biennium that didn't account for the voices of the Minnesotans who live here. And members, when we think about green space, when we think about the space just to the north of our state office building and the Minnesotans that exit the light rail, they should feel safe. They should feel welcome for all different cultural and ethnic back backgrounds that they come from. And somehow, this body failed to recognize that over the last two years. So tonight, that's why we're offering this amendment. I urge support of this amendment. And let's make sure that we're doing well by the community that lives here. Because in case you haven't heard, and it can't, in case you don't drive the road that drives right through it, there's a lot of work to be done to ensure the safety of the community right here around the Capitol complex. Thank you, members. Representative Cleborn. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I would like to, one, acknowledge your commitment to the Capitol Mall complex and protecting the green space around uh, our community as well. And to um, the amendment itself, it is an important amendment in that we all want green space. We all want to see the plan of Cass Gilbert, that the mall of the Capitol is the front yard for the state of Minnesota and its surround, and the Capitol surrounding community. Thank you very much, members. I encourage you to vote green. Representative Schultz. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, she just touched on a point that uh, is worthy of note here because if any of you have reviewed a certain plan for a certain building, which we may one day have the chance to occupy in a greater fashion, there's actually massive concern because the designer of our capital and this capital space did not, did not design for there to be a building immediately to the west of our capital, which accentuates the point that we should not be spending $500 million when Minnesotans are dealing with the cost of crazy inflation in this state. We need to be better stewards of our taxpayer dollars and protect the hardworking Minnesotans of our state. The clerk, oh, all those in favor of the Schultz Amendment, please say aye. aye. Those opposed, please say no. The motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. There are no further amendments at the desk. The clerk will give the bill its third reading. Third reading, House Bill number 1830, as amended. Third reading, as amended. Discussion to the bill. The member from Brown, Representative Torkelson. Thank you, Madam Speaker and members. Uh, I'll be speaking in relation to the elections portion of this bill. 
Uh, this evening we are voting on the second major elections bill in less than a week. And while there are many provisions in this bill that do have bipartisan support, there are many other ideas that only Democrats support. That's why I'm calling it the Protect DFL Victories Act II. Just like last week's will, bill, we will again see, likely see a court challenge. Last week it was express advocacy and First Amendment rights. This week it is questions regarding the constitutionality of the national popular vote. I will remind you again that Minnesota has a long history of bipartisan support for election bills and governors from three different parties over the last number of decades requiring that elections bills that reach their desk be bipartisan election bills before they were willing to sign them. That has been abandoned this year. As evidence of this, uh, Republicans introduced 71 elections-related bills. Out of those 71 election-related bills, one of them was heard in the Elections Committee. It actually received warm support, a lot of support in the committee, but it was not included in either of the election bills that we've heard on the floor. No Republican bills have made it into either omnibus elections bill. Governor Waltz expressed publicly in 2019 that he expected election bills to be bipartisan. The governor has flipped, he is now willing to sign a partisan bill, and he is justifying this flip with a false narrative that every Republican is denying the results of the 2020 election. Minnesota elections have a long history of nation-leading turnout and high voter confidence. Many of the provisions in these bills will have a negative impact on voter confidence and burden local election officials with higher costs and heavier workloads. We could have worked together to present a bill that both parties could support, but instead we have the Protect DFL Victories Act II. The member from Hennepin, Representative Greenman. Uh, thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, and I am really proud of this bill. This is a really good bill that reflects the values that we have both um, as a state government and as a democracy that works for all Minnesotans, no matter where they live, what they look like, or who they vote for. This is an important bill that meets the moment, a moment that calls for us to protect and, def and strengthen democracy. There's so much in this bill that I am proud of. Chair Freiburg, you put together a really good elections bill. But you've heard a lot of, uh, from me talking about strengthening the freedom to vote and the voices of Minnesotans, and the hour is late. So I just want to talk about one provision in this bill, the election worker protection provision uh, to protect election workers and our local elections infrastructure. In Minnesota, we have a proud tradition of trusted and strong local elections administration. Every year, 30,000 of our friends and neighbors in every community in the state pitch in to help prepare and staff our polling places, prepare and send absentee ballots, and process the ballots and canvas results. Since the 2020 election and the January 6th insurrection, their job has gotten tougher and pressure more intense. The Minnesotans who have worked in the background doing apolitical work of ensuring our elections run smoothly are unfortunately been thrust in the, the, um, the limelight with its increasingly political environment, heated rhetoric, disinformation about voting machines, social media, and an irresponsible and misplaced target on their back. If you were, were in elections committee, you would have heard the eye-opening uh, results of a survey conducted by an elections administrator from Blue Earth County on behalf of the Minnesota Association of County Officers. 57% reports of election workers who responded say they've been intimidated while performing their duties. 46.2% say that they've added additional physical security measures to their polling places. In Minnesota, by passing this bill, we have the opportunity to act together to show our local elections officials that this conduct, threats, interference, inter intimidation is unacceptable. We can say clearly that intentional interference or tampering with machines will not be tolerated. And something else I'm really proud of in this bill, it includes for the first time ever, sustained and permanent funding for the counties and local jurisdictions who are administering our elections. 
It doesn't seem like much, but it's a big deal. It's a big deal because it's the state of Minnesota saying and showing our commitment to trusted local elections administration and putting our money where our mouth is. This bill invests in the infrastructure of our democracy, a democracy where all Minnesotans are at the center. And members, I would ask you to vote yes. The member from Carver, Representative Nash. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Uh, Chair Cleavorn, I will tell you that I have appreciated many of the things that we've gotten done in committee. I have enjoyed our conversations about IT. Uh, I will tell you, members, that we had a great conversation about public television one day. And I would love to vote for parts of this bill. I really would. I, I am very pleased to see that the, the needs that we have at Minute are being addressed. And I, will, I, I want to thank our both partisan and nonpartisan staff uh, in the committee. You all have worked very long hours, and I'm very grateful. Uh, we have, I think, a very good working relationship, Madam Chair. And as I said, I, I, well, here's an example. The language that we have in here that uh, has had some level of controversy between Minkoji and the OLA, we are going to need to uh, exercise that agreement that we have and probably take it out in conference or work on it so that we can get it agreed upon Somewhere in there, we have to achieve that so that we can make sure that those stakeholders uh, achieve what they are really hoping for. But members, as much as I would like to vote for parts of this bill, I can't vote for the bill. And you have heard me say this quote before, but it's a great quote. It's from Oscar Wilde, so it's uh, a very respectable. And it's, the bureaucracy is expanding to meet the needs of the expanding bureaucracy. The bureaucracy is expanding to meet the needs of the expanding bureaucracy. What we have seen in this bill is we are 41% uh, over base. That's a lot. It's 45 million over base in this bill. Madam Speaker gave you a very generous target. And Madam Chair, you stuck the landing, I guess. Um, I, I certainly understand that there are investments that need to be made in state government. But I know, too, that there are a lot of people who are watching what's going on down here right now back in our districts, some who are very political like we are and some who aren't. And they see headlines on TV. They see headlines on newspapers. Uh, they might see posts on social media. And they're beginning to get a little concerned because they thought they were going to get a, a healthy um, rebate from the state. They thought they were going to see their Social Security tax uh, eliminated. They thought that we would be taking care of some of the issues that they are deeply, ter uh, deeply concerned by, and we're not. Uh, as other members, like Representative Zelesnikar, have pointed out, some of the nursing home issues have yet to be met, but this bill, while it has things that are good, is really designed to expand the bureaucracy. And, and we had asked for an estimation in some of the new employees that will be created. Uh, and I think there's, there's some differing numbers out there, but we have, I think, 341, and it could be plussed up to a little bit more than that. And that's a lot of new bureaucrats walking the halls down here at state government. And that comes at a great, a great expense. There are troubling things in the bill pretty much every, every couple of pages. And I will say this one thing, Madam Chair. There were times in committee that we wished that we could have had more time to discuss things. The schedule, not always conducive. Uh, I will be very honest. Some of my members felt, and they, I, we have some brand new members, and they were hoping that we'd have not protracted and, and punishing conversations as we do sometimes here on the floor but just honest to goodness conversations in committee. And I hope that as we move forward uh, with maybe information bills this year and policy bills next, that we can, we can do better. I will deviate from the state government finance very quickly to talk about the elections bill. Uh, Representative Torkelson referenced earlier that there was, there was one bill from Republicans that was heard in the elections committee, and it, it, it was mine. Super controversial, so controversial that the League of Minnesota Cities, the, the Minnesota Counties Association, and uh, the League of uh, Minnesota Counties 
all wrote a letter, said, great bill, let's do this. And if you'll remember, it was a bill that said on the exterior of an envelope that we should print uh, for a, an absentee ballot request, this is not an actual ballot. Super difficult. And uh, Chair Freiberg, I, I actually had a brief moment of hope when my bill was called into your committee. There is not one, not one Republican provision in the elections bill. Now, you know that Republicans vote in the state of Minnesota, and you know that Republicans get elected in the state of Minnesota, and I still cling to this notion that once upon a time, there were leaders in the majority party and in power that respected on an elections bill the voice of the minority party and wanted to bring to that conversation the voice of that, much like Representative Newton did with the Veterans Bill. I was very grateful for that, by the way. We had an opportunity to, to really have a conversation in elections, and I, I guess I was the token Republican, and that's disappointing. There are a lot of things in this bill that spend lots and lots and lots of money. And I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna bring up the mansion again, but what this will do to many folks, because the funding source that you're going to go and obtain comes from the wallets of people who are around the state of Minnesota. Small business owners up and down Main Street are gonna have to make tough decisions. Families may have to get more jobs because of an aggregated increase in spending that the majority party has pursued. And it's not just this bill, but this is the one we're talking about now. There will be reactions that have to happen. There will be some businesses that uh, file bankruptcy or go out of business or they just give up. They're like, I'm done. I certainly understand our needs to provide for government, but Ideologically, we would like to see a lot less growth or flat. I was disappointed that we couldn't pursue some of the things that were in there from an IT perspective that could actually show that we were obtaining efficiencies and saving labor. We didn't do that. But again, I will say um, my perspective, our perspective, this is a, this is a very bureaucrat-friendly bill. And Oscar Wilde got it right, that this bill serves to, to help the bureaucracy expand the needs of the expanding bureaucracy. Members, I cannot vote for this. I will not vote for this. I encourage a red vote. As much as I like some of the provisions, Madam Chair, I can't do it. Vote no. The member from Hennepin, Representative Freiburg. Thank you, Speaker. So I've heard a lot of talk about how this bill contains only democratic provisions or democrat provisions as the other side likes to say. I'd push back on that because many of these provisions do in fact have bipartisan support. The redistricting litigation reimbursement provision is also contained within a representative Nash bill. Some of the technical bills from the agencies have bipartisan support. I'm not gonna lie, the major party threshold provision is controversial but it had letters of support from the heads of both the Republican Party and the DFL, which I would say makes it the very definition of a bipartisan bill, as well as the chair of the grassroots legalized cannabis party. The national popular vote bill has a Republican co-author. Even beyond those, Minnesotans of both parties support the provisions in this bill. Beyond that, this claim that the only elections bills that we should pass are those that have some artificially constructed level of bipartisan support is a canard. In 2017 and 2018, when the GOP last controlled the House, the majority passed several election-related bills off the floor on a partisan line vote. This included the repeal of the public subsidy program and a restriction on rulemaking by the Campaign Finance Board. And of course, there's the voter ID amendment that passed the legislature in the 2011-2012 biennium with unipartisan support in one chamber that was rightfully rejected by Minnesota voters. But even beyond that, it's worth mentioning that many of the election-related bills introduced by my GOP colleagues just aren't very good. Uh, there were 25 GOP-authored bills referred to the Elections Committee before the second committee deadline, some only barely. I don't know where the 71 number came from. I checked the website to see how many were introduced. Five of those 25 bills would require photo ID to be displayed before anyone can register to vote or to vote. 
And I don't know why five bills on this topic needed to be introduced, but whatever, voter ID is a bad idea that was rejected by Minnesota voters. Three of the bills I mentioned would require provisional balloting in some circumstances. We voted that down twice, so I won't dwell on it. I'm not going to bend over backwards to include bad ideas in a bill to accommodate a pledge Madam made Speaker, a point of order. Representative Nash, please state your point of order. I rise under Mason's 124 personalities not permitted in debate. Bad ideas connote bad human beings. I would urge Representative Freiburg to stay out of that and let's, uh, let's, let's get straight. Representative Nash, by talking about the ideas, he's not bringing personalities into uh, the conversation. Representative Torkelson talked a lot about what he thought about Democrats in his speech and Representative Freiburg as well within the bounds of reasonable debate. Representative Freiburg, you have the floor. Thank you, Speaker. Even the ideas uh, that weren't necessarily bad had problems. Representative Nash's bill that we heard did not receive warm support, as he put it. There were concerns raised in committee about the way it was drafted and potential inadvertent effects. There were multiple versions introduced last year, and I never heard an agreement about what language was preferable. There was also no amendment offered to put it here um, in the bill on the floor, which was well within the rights of the minority. I could list more examples, but I won't. So let's, let's make this positive here. Setting all that aside, the elections portion of the bill protects our election workers, makes voting, voting more accessible, and provides clarity on who is funding our elections. This bill will help ensure every eligible voter can exercise their civic duty to participate in our elections without barriers meant to suppress the vote. These are provisions that Minnesotans want. I am excited to support these provisions and to carry them into conference. I'm excited about the provisions in the state government portions of the bill. Thank you, Chair Cleavorn, for putting together a great bill. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't particularly grateful for the inclusion of the State Emblems Redesign Commission that's in the bill. I'd like to thank Committee Administrator Simon Brown, Committee Legislative Assistant Mike Hermanson, researchers John Beeler and Lori Cousino, nonpartisan staff Matt Gehring and Helen Roberts, Paige, Chris Ollendorf, and members of the committee on both sides. I do appreciate the discussions I've had with the other side of the aisle. We had some very lively discussions, sometimes too lively, but this is a great bill and I would encourage members to vote green. The member from Stearns, Representative Damuth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And members, tonight we've had an opportunity to look at this bill um, in depth. And I do have just a couple of questions if Representative Cleborn would yield for just a couple of questions. She will yield. Representative Damuth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And Representative Cleborn, um, we're giving major increases in very a number of agencies in this bill and in other budget bills. And so my question, Representative Cleborn, is are there any cost savings provisions that you can identify within the bill? Representative Cleborn. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And yes, there are, in fact, cost savings in this bill. Uh, you will see that um, there are reductions in the bill for offsets that are going into the governor's budget. We have changed the way, so there will be efficiencies in the way that we conduct the office of the governor and the interactions between the agencies. Instead of the process of billing and transferring funds back and forth between the agencies and the governor's office, there will be now be a direct appropriation which streamlines the process, so there will be efficiencies there. With the investments that we are making in IT, you will be able to see that in this um, FTE count, which is much high, this number that you cite is much higher than the number that I've been able to calculate. But you will see that in the beginning there are more employees and in some of the agencies then the employee number drops down. So yes, we are looking for efficiencies and as our systems become better, especially in places like grants management, well, you'll see the grants management oversight. And with the ability for one agency to be able to communicate with another once we move to the cloud, to the, uh, cloud we will find efficiencies there too. And there will be cost savings in that way. At this moment, uh, what I would say to you is that many of the systems that we have are crumbling, and so we are spending money now trying to hold together old systems that are antiquated with paper clips and twine and bubble gum, and that's very expensive. And so, yes, it appears at this moment that this is a lot of money going into government. Anybody who says $400 million is not a lot of money 
is not telling you the truth. It is a lot of money, but it's a lot of money going into good things. The most expensive pair of shoes, my mother told me, is a pair of cheap shoes because you're constantly replacing them. Make the investments, do it right, make it work, and then you save money in the long run. Representative Damuth. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you for that answer, Representative Cleavorn. Um, I do have just two more questions. Next question, if she would yield. She will yield, Representative Damuth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, if I could draw your attention to the changes that are made to the Compensation Council, and that is found in Article 2, Section 19, starting on lines 33.16. Representative Cleavorn, um, why is this bill removing the layer of accountability by allowing this unelected council to give pay raises to politicians without legislative, uh, without legislative approval? Representative Cleavorn. Thank you, um, Madam Speaker. It's an important question. And what I would say to you is when the legislature makes the decision to move to this format, as it did with our own legislative salaries, we are not giving up our approval. What we are saying is that we are bringing in individuals who will do the research, look at the um, market factors, and make the decisions necessary so that we can retain and uh, recruit the caliber of individuals to work in our agencies and to serve our government and to serve the people of Minnesota that is appropriate. Um, the people of Minnesota do not park their brains when we ask them to do this. They use their skills, their talents to come up with the best answers. They have a vested interest in making sure that they are using tax dollars wisely as well. And if I could give you an example of where we do this in other places, um, since we talk a lot in this chamber about a greet um, and agriculture, a greet is a fine example of where the, this body has said we are going to give dollars to citizens to make decisions about agriculture so that we can have the professors that we need at the University of Minnesota to do that. We do this in other places of government as well. Representative Damuth. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and Representative Cleborn, I appreciate the example. My concern, members, is that this is actually taking out um, the portion that says to assist the legislature in establishing the compensation, and that was to assist the legislature. Um, if uh, Representative Cleborn, Madam Speaker, if she would yield for one more question. She will yield. Representative Damuth. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, Representative Cleborn, it is, is it your belief that our governor and commissioners all of whom stand to get major raises because of this bill are underpaid. Representative Cleborn. Is it my belief? That's an interesting question that you ask. The opinion of Ginny Cleborn, the beliefs of Ginny Cleborn are not what I'm here to do. What I am here to do is to represent the people that have sent me here. The people who have sent me here have asked me to work to improve and enhance the systems that we have so that government works efficiently. And yes, I believe that creating this compensation council will help in that way, and I'm doing exactly what I was asked to do. Representative Damuth. Thank you, Madam Speaker, and thank you, uh, Representative Cleavorn. What I do know is that uh, Minnesotans are not asking to have more than $9 billion in taxes raised to complete, uh, over the complete budget. That is not what Minnesotans sent us here to do. Billions of dollars in tax hikes are going to be in the transportation that we will hear later. Hundreds of millions of dollars in tax hikes are going to be in the housing bills that are gonna be up tomorrow. Billions of dollars in new payroll taxes for our, the proposed paid leave are gonna be coming our way. And billions of dollars in tax hikes in the tax bill, giving Minnesotans one of the highest tax brackets in the country. 
That's not what Minnesotans want us to do, not with a $17.5 billion surplus. So I have to ask myself, why do Democrats need these tax increases? Well, what I can see so far through this session is those tax increases are needed to pay for the millions and millions of dollars in wasteful spending. We're seeing pay raises for the governor, pay raises for the lieutenant governor, pay raises for legislators, pay raises for commissioners, and again, that has been mentioned earlier, we are seeing a $17,000 per month lease for our governor while the mansion is being renovated. $17,000 per month. Democrats also blocked the amendment last week that would have capped the U of M president's pay because they didn't think that half a million dollars was quite enough. We're growing agency budgets across the entire DFL budget. There's 21% increase over the base for the Department of Education, 24% increase for the state auditor, 67% increase for the Attorney General's office, 75% for MMB, 137% increase for the Department of Administration, 155% increase for the Governor's office, and I want to make sure everybody heard that, 155% increase for the Governor's office. This puts this bill puts $10 million into fixing roads around the Capitol, while residents in nearby low-income neighborhoods continue to have to swerve sometimes into oncoming traffic to prevent the crater-sized potholes that are in the area. The increases in this bill are outrageous. There isn't one Democrat sitting across the aisle who campaigned on growing state agencies by double-digit percentages and giving an already bloated bureaucracy thousands of new FTEs. But I must admit that this bill includes some of the most partisan election provisions ever seen in this chamber. It violates the decades-long bipartisan expectation that election bills have bipartisan support, and, it makes, and we want to make sure that our elections are secure yet this bill makes them less secure. Minnesotans expect that their tax dollars are going to be spent wisely. They expect that we are doing everything to stretch the dollars that they are sending in to St. Paul. They expect us to find efficiencies where we can. But this bill fails to meet that expectation. It relies on billions in tax hikes to fund pay raises for politicians, road upgrades, for politicians, and a new luxury office building, so members vote no. The member from Hennepin, the author of the bill, Representative Cleborne. Thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I too would like to begin this evening um, in closing. One, it's a great bill, and I'm really excited about this bill. And uh, <laughs> my mother told me when I was a young girl, good will be attacked but do good anyway. You know, it's the upbringing that I have. So I wanna begin with the debt of gratitude to you, Lead Nash, for working with me. And you know as well as I do that this bill contains a lot of good work that we've worked on together. And I wanna thank you for that cooperation and collaboration. I wanna thank your researcher, Ryan Wickersham. Great job in committee, always there, just wonderful. To our own DFL team, I, I call them my brain trust, Amanda Rudolph, the CA, the researcher John Baylor, Jonah Westerman, my CLA. I also want to give a shout out to Eric Peterson and Sam O'Neill who came in and uh, did really great work for us earlier in the year, and Tenzin, uh, our page, who just really was helpful and just did everything great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. To our nonpartisan staff, Matt Gehring, Helen Roberts, Chelsea Griffin, 
without your expertise and your long knowledge, we couldn't do the work we're pos that's possible here. You know, I heard the word bureaucrat thrown around quite a bit tonight. And bureaucrat, what does that mean? When I hear that, I think about the dedicated public servants who come to work every day in service of our state. These people do not deserve pejoratives. They deserve our gratitude. And they deserve to be paid in a way that they can afford to go to the grocery store and buy their groceries too. Uh, in this bill, we are fulfilling the investments that Minnesotas did in fact send us here to do. That's why we're here. Um, when we talk about, you know, crime in neighborhoods and we talk about pot hole, uh, potholes and roads and crumbling infrastructure, it's because we failed to take the hard political decisions to raise the taxes to fix the roads. That's what we were sent here to do. We were sent here to make sure that government takes care of the obligations it has to its citizens. I want everyone to feel proud when you vote yes on this bill tonight. You are building the state that Minnesotans want to live in. Thank you very much, and I encourage a green vote. The clerk will take the roll on the bill. Members, please vote. The clerk will close the roll. There being 70 ayes and 59 nays, the bill is passed as amended and its title agreed to.